and come to the another topic that is the pain. What is pain? Pain is a unpleasant sensation, so which is enhances and experienced associated with or without actual tissue damage is called as pain it is. The pain sensation is described as in many ways like a, a sharp, pricking, electrical, dull ache, shooting, cutting, stabbing, like etc. And next one is often it is induced dry and fainting it may be. And next one is the benefits of the pain sensation. If you see this, the benefits, the pain is very important sensory symptoms. Through this unpleasant sensation, it happens by the protective and the survival sensation, the benefits such as the pain gives warning signals and the pain prevents the further damage by the that stimulus, extraordinary stimulus. And next one is the pain forces the person to rest the minimize activities and next one is pain urges the person to take the required treatment for the damage from the further damage of the tissues and whatever it is and next one if you see the components of the pain there are two types of the components are present one is fast pain and another one is slow pain the fast pain and the one so which is affected immediately and the slow pain is slowly by the stimulus slowly the pain is arrested is called as slow pain it is this if you see the pathway of this pain sensation the pathway from the skin and the deeper structures and the pathway from the face and the pathway from the viscera and the pathway from the pelvic region and if you see the visceral sensation, the pain from the viscera is unpleasant and it is poorly localized it is. And referred pain, visceral pain and the referred pain. It is completely local pain it is and next one is referred pain. In the sense, pain actually, the pain occurs in one place and the, the sensation, the stimulus is in another place. is called as referred pain. The referred pain is the pain that prescribed or the perceived at the site adjacent to the away from the site of the actual region is called as a referred pain. So if you see the examples of this referred pain, so the cardiac pain felt in the inner part of the left arm, heart pain felt in the left arm. Okay. And next one and the left shoulder. Okay. And pain in the ovary referred to the umbilicus. Pain in the ovaries, in case of females, referred to the umbilicus in the abdomen. And next one, pain from the test is felt in the abdomen. And next one, pain from the diaphragm is referred to the shoulder, right shoulder. In case of the diaphragmatic pain is there, then the uh, sensation, the pain sensation is in the right arm. And next one is pain. In the renal pain is referred to the loin and if you see the pain regions that is like in the lungs heart diaphragmatic pains and the gallbladder pains and the kidneys ovaries testes all these are the best examples for the referred pain and next one if you see the pathway of this pain is the receptors which are present in the like free nerve endings and the passini and carpassi. It is nothing but the lateral spinothalamic tract. The pain sensation pathway is nothing but the lateral spinothalamic tract. Okay, and if you see this, the marginal nucleus and the substantia gelatinosa, the receptors receive the impulses and it sends to the marginal nucleus of the spinal cord and through that it sends that information to the uh, spinal cord and through the spinal cord it reaches to the medulla oblongata the nucleus of the raphe magnus and from the medulla oblongata it reaches to the midbrain there the gray matter 
receives the signals and the regular formation of the impulses and then the reach to the thalamus. After that, it directly goes to the sensory cortex. See once again, the posterior nerve ganglion, root ganglion, from the, the inhibitor inhibition, the marginal nucleus and through the spinal cord, it reaches to the medulla, thalamus and to the sensory cortex, lateral spinothalamic tract. And next one, if you see the exact this, so gate control, so where the gates are closed for the inhibition of the impulses, for the closing of the gates, for inhibition of the pain, is called as gate control theory, that is in the pain fibers in the marginal nucleus are closed and they the pain, pain sensation not reach to the further that to the medullary oblongata and to the thalamus sensory cortex that is and if you see the applied aspects of this analgesia in the sense loss of the pain sensation is called as analgesia and hyperalgesia in the sense uh, increased sensitivity to the pain sensation and paralgesia is nothing but abnormal pain sensation is called as paralgesia. Next one is brain stem. The brain stem is nothing but the dentate nucleus and it reached from the dentate nucleus the connections if you see that it is cross the midline and dentate nucleus through the superior cerebellar peduncle it reached to the red nucleus and through the cortex and next one is through the putamen and the globus pilaris through all this the information reached to the red nucleus this is the efferent pathway efferent connections it is and if you see the efferent connections that is from the red nucleus the information sends to the thalamus and third fourth sixth cranial nerve fibers and at the same time to the spinal cord and also to the inferior olivary nucleus and the reticular formation and next thalamus if you see the efferent and efferent connections of the thalamus so from where thalamus gets information that is called as efferent fibers efferent it is okay from the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe and precuneus nucleus and hypothalamus, globus pilaris, midbrain, red nucleus, reticular formation, dentate nucleus, trigeminal lemniscus and the lateral lemniscus, medial lemniscus, spinal lemniscus and auditory tract and the optic tract. All these sense information to the thalamus and from the thalamus different connections to the prefrontal cortex, parietal lobe and next occipital lobe, auditory cortex, visual cortex, limbic cortex and uh, hypothalamus, putamen and caudate nucleus. Different letters. And if you see the functions of the thalamus, it is a relay center it is. Thalamus is a relay center and center for processing of the signals and center for determination and center for the quality of the signaling and next one center for the sexual sensation and next role in the arousal and the alertness reactions and after the center for relax reflex activity is center for the integration of the motor activity and next one is internal capsule if you see this inter internal capsules there are three lobes are present so one is geno and another one is anterior limb and next one is posterior limb in case of Gino, the head of the caudate nucleus is present and next cortico, uh, cortico bilor tracts and the cortico spinal tracts, cortico tectal tracts, all these are auditory radiation and the visual radiation, all these are goes through the internal capsule. And next one is hypothalamus. If you see this hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is a diencephalic structure it is it is situated just below the thalamus in the ventral part of the diencephalon and it is formed by the group of the nucleus and the scattered in the voice of the flow of the third ventricle it extends from the optic chiasma to mammillary valley 
and next one if you see the connections of this hypothalamus first efferent connections are from the limbic cortex hippocampus amygdala frontal cortex globus pallidus thalamus reticular formation and from the retina and if you see the efferent connections where it sends that information from the hypothalamus in the sense the anterior to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and the midbrain next one is reticular formation dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus and the frontal cortex and the posterior pituitary gland different connections these are and next one if you see the functions of this hypothalamus the secretion of the posterior pituitary hormones by the hypothalamus through the hypothalamo hypophyseal tract it sends the hormones and next one control of the anterior pituitary and next control of the adrenal cortex by the acrh and the control of the adrenal medulla and all these are hormonal actions and the regulation of the adenomic nervous system and regulation of the heart rate and regulation of the blood pressure and next regulation of the body temperature regulation of the hunger and the food intake regulation of the water balance regulation of the sleep and the wakefulness and next one is regulation and the role in case of the behavior and the emotional changes and the regulation of the sexual functions role in the response to the smell and role in the circadian rhythm all these are the functions of the hypothalamus and next one is cerebellum if you see the cerebellum so the cerebellum is a part so it contains two major parts one is hemisphere and another one is vermis and this contains primary fissure horizontal fissure and the posterior fissure three parts are present and if you see the connections to this all the efferent connections for, from for the cerebellum so that is like midbrain pons inferior uh, inferior inferior pons and the embolmophonic uh, fasciculus and the labyrinth spinal cord and the vestibular nucleus all these are the efferent connections and if you see the efferent connections the uh, tracts fasciculobular tracts and the cerebellum uh, vestibular tract and next one is lateral vestibular tract and medial vestibular tract and the reticulospinal tract all are goes through this so what is efferent connections and the tracts like this are the this descending tracts like the uh, cerebellum cortical tracts all are the efferent connections and next one if you see the functions of this the regulation of the tone and posture by this and the division of the spino cerebellum and the vestibular cerebellum are functioning for this and the regulation of the coordination of the movements by the cortico cerebellum and after this basal ganglia basal ganglia is one of the important part so which is uh, undergo for the so many functions for the movement and the flexion extension of the so body is in under control of this basal ganglia and the lateral ventricle caudate nucleus putamen globus pallidus mammillary body thalamus aptic tract and the third ventricle all are functioning for this basal ganglia and next one is efferent connection to the this basal ganglia to the caudate nucleus and to the globus pallidus and to the putamen the from the cortex the signals reach to the caudate nucleus and the putamen and from the thalamus to the putamen and the caudate nucleus and the, from the subthalamic nucleus there is the reaching of the signals to the globus pallidus and substantia nigra also sends that information to the putamen and next one is if you see the uh, efferent connections from the globus pallidus putamen and the uh, this caudate nucleus the information goes to the thalamus hypothalamus reticular formation red nucleus and the subthalamic nucleus and next one if you see the compartments and the efferent connections efferent connections clearly the corpus striatum efferent connections from the thalamic thalamic nuclei cerebellar cortex and substantia nigra subthalamic nuclei and substantia nigra to the substantia nigra the putamen 
frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, superior colliculus and the mammillary body, medial and the lateral lemonisci and the, to the uh, red nuclei. And the subthalamic nuclei, uh, efferent connections from the globus pallidus. And if you see the efferent connections uh, to the, from carpus striatum to the thalamic nuclei, subthalamic nucleus, red nucleus, substantia nigra, hypothalamus, reticular formation. And from the substantia nigra directly to the putamen. And subthalamic nucleus uh, to the globus pallidus and the uh, red nucleus. And next one, if you see the functions of the basal ganglia, it controls muscle stone and next one, control of the motor activity and next one, control of the reflex muscular activity and control of the autonomic associated movements, role in arousal mechanism and the role in the neurotransmitters in the function of the basal ganglia. And next one is, if you see the applied aspects like Parkinson's zoneism, so which contains tremors, treasures, shivering and all this, so Parkinson's zoneism and Wilson disease and chorea atheosis and next one is uh, chorea atheosis and next one is Huntington chorea. And next part is cerebral cortex. If you see the cerebral cortex layer, there are six types of the layers are present. That is the molecular or the plexiform layer and the external granular layer and next outer pyramidal layer and the internal granular layer and next ganglionic layer and the fusiform cell layer. And next one is, if you see the parts of this, the it contains totally four lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe and the olfactory bulb are present and if you see the parts of in this it contains cerebral circus central circus in between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe and the parieto occipital circus in between the occipital and the parietal lobe and the temporal in between the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe temporal, temporal pole and the lateral fissure are present and next one is, if you see the motor and sensory regions in the cerebral cortex, so there are the primary motor cortex and the primary sensory cortex is present and the sensory area number one, sensory somatic area number two and next one is visual association area is present and the visual cortex and the Wilkinson's area which is understand as per the speech and the uh, Broca's area which is responsible for the speech and next one uh, auditory association area, auditory cortex, all types of these visual sensations and the auditory sensation, the speech centers and the, all the centers are present in this itself. Okay and next one is uh, the areas like uh, primary motor area with 4S and the 4 and the somatic, somatic, somesthetic area number one, it contains area number one, two, three, and next one, somesthetic area number two, it contains uh, seven and five, so which is somesthetic association area and primary visual areas, area number 17, and the visual association area with area number 18 and 19, and the occipital eye field is the 19. And the Wilkins area, area number, area is W and next one, primary auditory area with area numbers 41 and 42 and auditory, auditory area that is with area number 22 and uh, Broca's area with 44 and 45 and the uh, areas, so all these are the areas which involves in the different types of the sensations. And if you see this, so it undergo for the functions, then the connections, if you see that the prefrontal area cortex contains primary motor area 4 and 4S, premotor area 6, 8, 44, 45 and the efferent fibers from the cerebellum and the thalamus. And efferent fibers to the corticospinal tract, pons, carpus striatum, red nucleus, thalamus, subthalamus and reticular formation. 
and after this prefrontal cortex area number 9 10 11 12 13 14 29 23 24 and 32 and efferent connections from the thalamus hypothalamus corpus striatum uh, amygdala midbrain and efferent connections to the thalamus hypothalamus uh, tegmentum and the caudate nucleus and the temporal lobe and if you see the somesthetic area number one that is with the area number one three two and next one is somesthetic area number two and somesthetic associative areas like five and seven all these are efferent connections from the thalamus somesthetic area number one so in somesthetic area number two respectively and next one is different connections to the somesthetic area number one that is premotor area and uh, Efferent fibers to somesthetic area uh, 2 is motor area and somesthetic association area efferent fibers to area number 1, somesthetic area number 1 it is. And next one is if you see the areas like uh, uh, primary visual area 17, 18, 19 to the lateral geniculate body and to the superior colliculus and lateral geniculate body, efferent and efferent connections and for the from the frontal lobe the lobe and the functions if you see precentral uh, cortex the primary motor area and the premotor area area number 4 4s area number 6 8 broca's area and all these are present area number 4 function is initiation of the movement area number 4s is inhibits the exaggeration of the movement and area number 6 is coordination on the movement and the area number 8 is frontal eye, eye field and the area number uh, Broca's area or the area number 44 is initiation of the movement involved in the speech. And prefrontal cortex area number like the area number 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 23, 24, 29 and 32. If you see these areas, the concern with the emotional learning, memory and social behavior and uh, acts as the plan action and seat of the intelligence is. And if you see the somesthetic area like area number one, so perceives the cutaneous and the kinesthetic sensations and the area number three and two for the integrates the cutaneous and the kinesthetic sensations and next one is area number three, two and one for the sense feedback to the premotor area, somesthetic area number two Oh, functioning is perceives cutaneous and the kinesthetic sensations and somesthetic area association area so uh, connections like areas number five and seven the function is synthesizes sensation in the perceives by the somesthetic area number one and next one is the secondary auditory area that is area number 22 it interprets the auditory sensation and the area for the equilibrium which maintains and the concern with the posture and equilibrium and next one is limbic system if you see this limbic system the limbic system is divides into four parts that is arachnoidal structure and the palatocortical structure and the juxta cortical structures and the subcortical structures first archi cortical structures these are hippocampus and the dendrite gyres and the pelicortical structures like pyriform cortex and the olfactory lobe and the olfactory tubule and next juxta cortical structures like uh, limbic cortex and the orbitolimbic cortex and next one, subcortical structures like amygdala, septal nucleus, thalamic nucleus, hypothalamic nuclei, caudate nucleus and the reticular formation of the midbrain. And if you see the limbic system properly, we will come to know with this diagram. So what's all this forms, the components of the diencephalon and the components of the cerebellum. So we, the cerebrum will see very clearly in this diagram. And next one, if you see the reticular formation connections, the connections, efferent connections, that in the sense towards the reticular formation, the cerebellum, cerebral cortex, thalamus, carpus striatum, spinal cord and the sensory pathways are 
through the reticular formation. And from the reticular formation, thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, cerebellum, cerebral cortex, spinal cord and red nucleus, substantia nigra and the tectum. And next one is, if you see the reticular formation, this divides into two parts. One is ascending reticular activating system and the descending reticular system. So the descending reticular system is divides into two parts. One is descending inhibitory reticular system and another one is descending facilitatory reticular system. And next one is proprioception and the proprioceptors. The proprioceptors are nothing but which maintains proprioception, equilibrium, posture and equilibrium. So whatever it is, in which position we have, we are not falling down just because of this proprioception. The like uh, uh, muscle spindle, Golgi tendon, Pacinian carpuscle, free nerve endings and the labyrinthus are the uh, proprioceptors and these are situated respectively the muscle spindle in the skeleton muscle and Golgi tendon in the tendons and the Pacinian carpuscle in the skin, uh, fascia, tendons, tissue around the joints and the joint carpuscle and free nerve endings are present in the skin, skeleton muscle, tendons, fascia and the joints and labyrinth proprioceptors are present in the labyrinth and it continues with the impulses from the gamma motor neuron and then there is activation of the intrafusal fibers and after that transmission of the impulses to the spinal cord via primary sensor nerve fibers and then it carries to the stimulation of, of the alpha motor neurons and immediately there is transmission of the impulses to the uh, alpha motor neurons and this alpha motor neurons stimulates the extra fusion fibers and then it is continuous with the parietal contraction of the muscle and the muscle tone is occurs and after that EEG what is EEG in the sense electroencephalogram so which records brain activity is called as EEG this EEG for the brain activities it contains different types of the waves like four types that is alpha waves beta waves gamma waves and the delta waves delta waves are very rare and the alpha beta theta waves are very common and here if you see these waves generally these waves recorded during the sleep or the so subconscious state of the brain that in the sense with the closure of the eyes and next one sleep what is sleep sleep is nothing but it is a natural periodic state of the rest of the mind and the body with the closed eyes characterized by the partial or the complete loss of the consciousness is called as sleep this sleep requires is not constant generally the sleep requirement in case of the newborns and the infants that is about 18 to 20 hours and in case of the growing children that is about 12 to 14 hours and in case of adults it is about 7 to 9 hours and in case of old persons it is about 5 to 7 hours and the types of sleep there are two types of the sleeps are present so one is REM sleep and another one is non-REM sleep the REM sleep is also called as rapid eye movement sleep and another one is non-rapid eye movement sleep. If you see the characters in case of the REM sleep and the non-REM sleep, that is with the characteristic features in this table. So when the rapid eye movement, rapid eye movement that in the sense after the closure of the eyes, the eyeball is moves. That is present in case of the REM sleep and absent in case of the non-REM sleep. And dreams are present in the REM sleep and absent in case of the non-REM sleep. In the total sleep, about in case of normal person, about 7 to 9 hours of the sleep, only about 30 minutes of the REM sleep is present. Remaining all the period is non-REM sleep itself. And the muscle twitching is present in case of the REM sleep and the absent in case of the non-REM sleep. And after that, heart rate is fluctuating in case of REM sleep and stable in case of non-REM sleep. 
and respiration blood pressure is fluctuating in case of REM sleep and stable in case of non-REM sleep. And body temperature is fluctuating in case of the REM rapid eye movement sleep and stable in case of the non-REM sleep. And the neurotransmitter is the noradrenaline in case of the REM sleep and in case of non-REM sleep serotonin is the uh, neurotransmitter for the non-REM sleep. And if you see the applied aspects of the sleep, insomnia, insomnia in the sense sleeplessness is called as insomnia and hyperosomnia in the sense oversleeping is called as hyperosomnia and narcolepsy or cataplexy, narcoplexy and sleep apnea syndrome, sleep apnea syndrome in the sense during the sleep there is apnea that in the sense loss of the breathing is called as sleep apnea and after that nightmare, nightmare and the night terror like uh, the breathe, dreams like which gets fear is called as nightmare and night terrors and next one is uh, somnambulism is nothing but the sleep walkiness during the sleep walking it is called as somnambulism and next one is uh, nocturnal enuresis this nocturnal enuresis is nothing but the urination during the sleep urine passage during the sleep is nothing but the nocturnal enuresis and next one is movement disorders during the sleep like uh, uh, movements of the body during the sleep is called as movement disorders of the sleep and next one is epilepsy generally this epilepsy is called as fits these are also called as uh, seizures this epilepsy is in three types the epilepsy is nothing but the condition with the sudden stoppage of the stimulus from the brain is called as epilepsy and this is in three types the generally it is in two types one is generalized epilepsy and another one is localized epilepsy in the generalized epilepsy again it divides into three types one is grand one and another one is petit mal and next one is psychomotor epilepsy grand mal epilepsy petit mal epilepsy psychomotor epilepsy the grand mal epilepsy in the sense just twitching of the uh, closing of the eyes and the twitching of the tongue and the uh, stretching of the teeth is the grand mal epilepsy and the petit mal is somewhat uh, that uh, the condition already knows the patient is getting that convulsion is called as petit mal epilepsy and next one psychomotor epilepsy when the psychic reactions or the when the emotional reactions are occurs at that time this feeds convulsions or the seizures or the epilepsy occurs is called as psychomotor epilepsy it is and localized epilepsy only one part of the body is gets epilepsed is called as a localized epilepsy it is and after that high intellectual functions these are involved with the learning uh, memory, uh, speech, hungry, all these are comes under this. First one is learning. What is learning? So whatever one person is saying, so listening to that and uh, picking up that is called as uh, uh, storing in the brain is called as learning. This learning is classified into two types. One is non-associative learning and another one is associative learning. Non-associative learning is nothing but the learning so like a fish so after the one anybody he, he learns this anybody teach the how to swim to that fish it is not at all that type of is called as non-associative learning and at the same time so one person teaching to another person at that time if third person is sitting just near to that area and if he is learning that particular matter that is called as non-associate whatever is not involving that third person is learning that thing is called as non-associative associative is nothing but like the class so whatever i am teaching you people are learning is the associative learning it is and next one is memory it is a storage thus memory is nothing but whatever we are learning so that keeps in the brain storage that is called as memory it is 
so this is in two types generally so basically it is anatomical and physiological after that so many classifications are there like anatomical basis physiological basis and next one chemical or molecular basis and consolidation and next one classification if you see uh, this so first one is the anatomical basis so anatomical basis memory is nothing but the whatever we are seeing okay and whatever we are looking for it okay so that is anatomical physiological in the sense whatever we want that's keep in the mind and remaining everything is uh, leave out is called as physiological memory and next one is chemical basis the chemically the intellectual function this memory is stored out that is called as chemical memory it is and consolidation is nothing but whatever we are learned whatever it is in our mind and when it requires at that time we'll speak out regarding that topic is called as consolidation and next one is uh, the drugs facilitating memory so which are influencing the memory the drug is called as a drug facilitating memory it is and next one is the conditional reflexes like uh, the reflexes which the person wants is that conditional reflexes unconditional in the sense without knowing is the unconditional the conditional in the sense whatever the person want to do is the conditional reflexes so this is classical conditional reflexes and the type of properties and the classical conditional reflexes if you see this so the positive conditional and the negative conditional reflexes and the uh, instrumental and the operant conditional reflexes and the if you see the reflexes this like if you are hearing about any food item like uh, whatever it is whatever you like like chicken or mutton or the veg whatever you are liking the food so if it is delicious to your tongue and immediately you will get saliva in your mouth that is the conditional reflex if you don't want to listen you can the saliva producing when you are getting thought of that particular food item and if you are seeing or if you are, uh, your vision is on some for what food material and you will get saliva and the secretions are starts in the uh, stomach and the pancreas also these are the conditional reflexes and the, once food enters into the mouth we can't do anything whatever the secretions want to digest further that is the unconditional reflex and next one is the conditional reflexes are divides into two types one is the classical conditional reflex and another one is instrumental conditional reflexes the conditional classical conditional reflexes are again divided into two types one is positive conditional reflexes and another one is negative conditional reflexes and the positive conditional reflexes like primary conditional conditional reflexes secondary conditional reflexes and the tertiary conditional reflexes and the negative reflexes like external and the internal internal again divided into four types one is extension and next one is conditioned inhibition inhibition by delay and uh, differential inhibition is the negative condition reflexes and next one is speech whatever we are learning that goes to the memory and regarding that whatever we are talking not only that the expression of our feelings is the speech this speech mechanism is majorly by the larynx the curtain like structures are present in the larynx of the pharynx when you are talking just think when you are talking there is a stoppage of the respiration and the air flows through the larynx and through the mouth and immediately the expression comes as the speech it is and this if you see the applied aspects aphasia in the sense uh, loss of the speech is called as aphasia and next is dystonia dystonia in the sense so what uh, it is like uh, disturbance during the talking and next one is dysphonia is nothing but the uh, can't express properly is called as dysmorphia 
and the stammering is nothing but while talking he is unable to talk properly he is called as stammering and next one is if you see the areas which are working for this the motor areas blocus area like area number 40 4 and 45 as responsible for the speech and the upper frontal motor area controls the movement movement in the writing so whatever we are learning and it keeps in the memory and next one is if you see that we are putting uh, on the paper by the writing is the writing okay so and next one is uh, sensory areas number 2 22 and 18 so which are concerned with the auditory sensation hearing and uh, so memories and the spoken words and next one is uh, Wilkins area which is responsible for the concerned with the interceptors of the auditory sensation and another one of the property is the habituation so what is habituation habituation is nothing but the thing whatever is going on continuously so the person is habituated to that particular for the example a mother with the baby is sleeping daily in some crowd area with the so many songs so she is adapted to that all types of the songs but when the baby cries immediately she woke up isn't it so that in the sense what she is habituated to all the surrounding sounds but she is very sensitive to the baby crying that is what habituation it is and next one is uh, Broca's area responsible for speech Wilkins area speech without any meaning and next one is Globus aphasia is the combined features of the Broca's aphasia and uh, nominal aphasia is uh, inability to the name familiar objects and the motor aphasia is difficulty to articulate uh, individual objects and the words and next one auditory aphasia is inability to understand the spoken speech or the words and the visual aphasia is inability to understand written symbols and the agraphasia is nothing but inability to write okay and next one is uh, CSF CSF is the cerebrospinal fluid which is present in the brain and the spinal cord. If you see this CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, it is very clear and colorless and the transparent fluid it is. And it circulates through the ventricles, third ventricle and fourth ventricles of the brain and the subarachnoid space and the central canal of the spinal cord. Subarachnoid space in the sense, the space between the arachnoid and the pinna. And it is a part of extracellular fluid and if you see the properties of this the volume is about 150 ml and the rate of formation is about 0.3 to 3 ml per minute and the specific gravity is about 1.005 and the reaction is alkaline and if you see the composition of this cerebrospinal fluid the water is about 99.13 percentage and the 0.87 percentage of the solids are present and in the solids again that divides into organic substances and the inorganic substances inorganic substances like sodium calcium potassium magnesium chlorides phosphates bicarbonates and the sulfates minerals and next one is organic substances like protein amino acids sugars cholesterol urea uric acid creatinine lactic acid are present and the lymphocytes also present in the csf that is about six cells per cubic millimeter and if you see the circulation of the csf so that is by the third ventricle choroid flexes the choroid flexes of the third ventricles it is formed and through the fourth ventricle and the foramen of mandro and foramen of the lisca so it uh, transported to the subarachnoid space and it is transported and if you see the circulation of this csf so that is by the formation of the cerebrospinal fluid in the lateral ventricle and through the lateral ventricles so it goes into the foramen of mandro and through the foramen of mandro it enters into the third ventricle and next aqueductus sylvius and through the aqueductus sylvius it enters into the fourth ventricle and from there foramen of mazende and foramen of lishka so it enters into the cisterna magna and the cisterna lateralis and from there 
through the central canal it enters into the spinal cord and sub subarachnoid through the subarachnoid space over the spinal cord and over the cerebral hemispheres so it enters and next one is uh, blood brain barrier the CSF acts like the blood brain barrier generally so all we are thinking that the blood supplies to the brain blood not supplies to the brain blood over the brain it present only over the brain and the whatever the nutrient substances carried to the brain that are transported to the brain by the CSF that's way it is called as CSF cerebrospinal fluid is called as blood brain barrier it is okay and if you see this blood brain barrier okay csf circulated throughout the brain by the subarachnoid spaces and through the central canals and nutritive substances drugs and the whatever so the substances it needs all those are so by the triple b blood brain barrier through that so it takes into the brain from the blood and another thing most important thing is injury counter cop injury counter cop injury in the sense the csf so protects the brain from the injuries if there is any blow front side and the brain will damage at this side that in the sense if the brain so blow at this in this area okay and the in the csf it swings like this okay and the this brain goes towards the uh, backwards and then there is a damage at the back side this is this is one what we call as counter cop injury and another one is <clears throat> autonomic nervous system the autonomic nervous system which is concerned with the so different types of the movements and the different types of the actions chemical reactions all are whether the inhibition or the secretion all are by the autonomic nervous system without consciousness of the brain it is and the, all these are by the ganglions and this is divides into two types one is sympathetic nervous system and another one is parasympathetic nervous system and in case of the the first we'll see what happens okay in case of the eye during the in case of sympathetic nervous system there is relaxation of the eye and the contraction of the eye and in case of pupil is dilated in case of sympathetic nervous system and the constriction in case of parasympathetic nervous system and next one is the salivary glands lacrimal glands decreases the secretion and the parasympathetic nervous system increases the secretion and next one is the salivary glands decreases the secretion sympathetic nervous system increases the secretion parasympathetic nervous system and next gastrointestinal tract the motility is inhibition contraction and the constriction decreases the secretions by the sympathetic nervous system and the relaxation increases acceleration and the contractions occur by the parasympathetic nervous system and in case of the gallbladder relaxation of the gallbladder by the sympathetic nervous system and the uh, contraction of the gallbladder by the parasympathetic nervous system and next one is the sweat glands are increased in the secretion by the sympathetic nervous system there is no action of the parasympathetic nervous system and heart rate increases by the sympathetic nervous system and uh, decreased by the parasympathetic nervous system and uh, blood vessels constriction by the sympathetic nervous system and the dilatation by the parasympathetic nervous system and the bronchial dilatation by the sympathetic nervous system and bronchial constriction because of the parasympathetic nervous system and if you see this we we'll come to know the sympathetic and the parasympathetic activities what are the ganglia are represents different uh, uh, organs in the case of sympathetic nervous system and this is what the parasympathetic nervous system which represents which organs from the which area and the parasympathetic nervous system by the cervical and the sacral segments and sympathetic nervous system by the thoracic and the lumbar segments 
This is what all over the nervous system and the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, all about this as per the, my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much.